Well, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to a new episode of our show, Tawheed, Spiritual Unity of the Three Principles. And uh, today we've got uh, two special guests. And uh, the, the first guest is Mamun Youssef, who is an author, speaker, and coach on a mission to take every human being on Earth through the inside out transformation. Uh, he is the host of British Muslim TV show, Taqwa Transformation, creator of the Quran for Busy People podcast and author of the best-selling book, uh, Inside the Soul of Islam. And the second special guest is uh, Rabbi Shaul Rosenblatt, um, the president of Better World Charity, uh, whose main purpose is to empower people to enjoy a healthier relationship with themselves uh, in all aspects of their life. And he's an author as well of Finding the Light in the Darkness. I haven't read this book. I should uh, grab one and read it, actually. And it's dealing with the issues, um, um, the, the issue uh, that is of hardship, uh, of dealing with hardship in a positive in a positive way. He is also uh, the founder of H UK, and it was founded in 1993, and Tikkun UK in 2006. Uh, if, if it's not correct, if the pronunciation is not correct, please uh, <coughs> talk to me, <laughs> And he's also, um, he works as a 3P practitioner at Tikkun, offering his help and guidance to all those that uh, seek it. And the topic today is the unity of Allah, God, and mind. I've been looking for the conversation because it's uh, such a beautiful topic. Uh, to clarify a lot of misunderstanding that we've got in the community about religion. And um, as you all know, like all religions differ in their outward practices and differ in their belief system, but they are very similar and points in the same direction when it comes to uh, spiritual dimension. As the Dalai Lama teaches us um, that, you know, the the many re uh, religion and spiritual traditions around the world are all wonderful. Each tradition is like a special blend of tea with particular herbs and leaves that give it a unique and delicious taste. It's not necessary for everyone to have one particular kind of tea, but everyone certainly needs the water uh, in any of the teas to hydrate themselves. The herb and leaves alone will not save the one dying of thirst. So today we're going to be exploring the um, the spiritual dimension of uh, of religion because this is where we all meet. Uh, this is uh, uh, where we all connect. So I'll give it over to Harry to say a few words, and then uh, over to Marilyn and Chol. Yeah, thanks, Omar. Uh, the idea of this show came about four or five years ago, I was at, at the uh, Tahi 3P UK conference. I, I did a little talk, but the, what was noticeable to me was that the most scintillating talk, the one that, that I felt was perhaps the best talk ever in Three Principles was with, with, with Rabbi Shaul, Shaul or Shaul, and uh, Mamoon and Elsie Spittles, Elsie representing the Christian movement and 3P and the other two. And it was original, it was fresh and it was alive. And they were really turned on, to be honest, very, very turned on. And so the energy was fantastic. And that's, that kind of was something when we, when Omar and I came together, which is a similar kind of concept show in the sense that Omar, Omar's a young Muslim from Casablanca, and I'm a old Jew from um, from Canada. Not too much into being a Jew, I, I might add, but you know, it's part of who I am, of course. And um, and so this idea of bringing people together, and sh and Shul, Shul said something. I was he invited me to a Shabbat uh, Saturday. Um, um, meal, and he was talking with uh, uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Solomon, who's, who's a psychiatrist from San Diego, and he said something that I felt was very, very profound. 
you're going to like that show, you know, so forth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, uh, he said, whenever I have an insight in the three principles, it enriches my understanding of the Jewish faith and, and its learning. And whenever I have an insight in the Jewish faith and learning, it enriches my understanding of the three principles. And I've, I felt that really touched me because I, I, of course, at that point was very strong into, as sort of as a shaman in, in native spirituality. And, and it showed me how the worlds help each other to understand the complexity or the fullness, the oneness that we, we treasure in, in, in who we are. So I'd, I'd like you to, to sort of discuss that. I have some other things that we'll, we'll, we'll go into as well, but I don't wanna make, could you sort of each individually address how that works for you and how your understanding of that uh, has helped you to develop as to become a better human being? which is a native concept of what the purpose of religion is to become a better human being. I'll defer to you, Mamun. Go ahead. I was about to do the same. Uh, uh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Shaw and Harry and Omar. Um, yeah, I, I, I love that like, a few people have uh, mentioned how deeply they were impacted by that conversation with uh, Rabbi Shaul in uh, the Three Principles Conference. And, uh, and I can't for the life of me remember what we were talking about. <laughs> I, 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 so I wish I could promise I'll be just as mind blowing today, but I have no idea. Uh, I just remember that, um, that there was a very, uh, well, it was just a very beautiful conversation. And uh, yeah, and I think it's refreshing for a lot of people just to see people from different faiths come together and talk about something that's at the essence and at the heart of all of them, which is a deeper understanding of the divine and a deeper understanding of, um, and I've got to say that just now, like as you were saying the words of Rabbi Shaul um, at the, uh, the incident that you mentioned, I was just thinking, yeah, that's exactly it. That is, now it doesn't deepen my understanding of the Jewish tradition, although maybe it does, right? I don't know much about the Jewish tradition, but it is exactly true for my understanding of the Quran, my understanding of the Islamic tradition. Um, yeah, I, I heard, uh, uh, I think it was Valdemar Rowe who said that ever since she came across this understanding, uh, she said, uh, well, I've just been nicening up we were like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, I already thought I was a pretty nice person, but, but I just keep getting nicer and nicer. And I thought that that, that was great too. And, it, and you're right, Harry, it is like the objective of, uh, of religion. And, and I can't speak for all religious traditions here, but I would imagine it's, uh, this is a common theme, right? The aim is to become a better and better version of yourself, which is to say to become really who you truly are to become the soul, the pure consciousness of the heart of who you are. And the whole tradition is just built around uh, uh, doing things. And although it's, it's seen as doing things, but really it's going into a place where you find that part of you again. I remember I was once at a conference and I saw, uh, it, was a, it was a Jamie Smart conference. And at some point he played a Sid Banks tape. And I was sitting back, it was at the end of the day, and we were listening to this Sid Banks tape. And he said something. I had no idea what he said, but I, I, I started to cry. I was like, so taken aback. And, and I'd heard people say that when you have a, you know, a really deep insight, you'll feel wonderful things and you'll, you won't know what it is that's being said. And I'd heard all these things before and I was like, oh, this something just happened. And, uh, and I asked Jamie afterwards, which tape it was. And I actually can't remember the name because I know somebody's going to ask, right? I can't remember the name, but, but, but I got the tape. I rewatched it several times. And then I, luckily I heard what I think it was that I heard the first time that really, uh, really had a profound effect. He said, um, something to the effect of, 
Don't seek God. Quiet your mind. And you'll find the part of you that has always been deeply connected with God. And that really just did something for me. I was like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, the journey is inward, right? And, and, and I couldn't have intellectualized it, but I just suddenly realized he was talking about the essence of all religion and the essence of all spiritual teaching, which is um, in, in Muslim terminology, it's um, you know seeing beyond the nafs or the egoic self and seeing the ruh or the, the spiritual self the pure soul, the pure light energy. Um, and I also wasn't at all surprised. Like, I, I think I was maybe, I was the first, well, let me put it this way. I was the first Muslim I knew who had come across the three principles and, and all this wonderful stuff until, of course, um, we met Hafiz the other day. Harry introduced me to Hafiz, right? Uh, who was one of Sid's students. Um, but I wasn't at all surprised to find out that it, it, that, it had cotton, that, that it had caught on in the Jewish community because I was like, oh yeah, because they get it, right? Because they have very clear spiritual teachings. They're, they're very clear about their tradition. Their tradition is also focused on, you know, it's the same God. And it's funny, the title of this talk, Unity, uh, the unity of God, Allah, and or and Allah, mind. my God and mind, right? And it, and it's important that we realize it's it's not the unity of three different things here, right? <laughs> like I know this is implied in the title, but it could be interpreted two ways. It's three different words for the same thing, right? Three different words for the same thing. As one spiritual teacher once told me, um, <laughs> same God, different target audiences, or, or same author referring to scripture, same author, different target audiences. <laughs> I always, I always like that one. <clears throat> yeah. So I think that's all I have to say to, I'm just rambling now. So sure. Stop me, Rabbi. <laughs> before I get myself in trouble. Just before you, let me do a quick, one, one of the outstanding movements in 3P, which was, was the Orthodox Jewish community embracing the three principles and the first person to do that was Scholl, who, who took it to the community. And it spread through Europe because of that, of that simple little seed that, that, just, that just spread all over. And uh, I have a friend on here, Marty. And both of us were, were uh, Scholl, astonished beyond compare that the Orthodox Jewish community would embrace uh, the teachings and so on. That's all I wanted to say. So go ahead, Shaw. Well, firstly, uh, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I love listening to you, Mamun. I feel you are a great advertisement for the three principles and, and a great advertisement for Islam. And I don't feel that's a coincidence. I feel the two of those things coming together is a very um, meaningful combination. Um, and I would say the same with Judaism also. One of the things that I think of and the things that often upsets me and disappoints me in the in the Jewish community, and, and I, whilst I can only speak to the Jewish community, obviously, my, my sense is that there's, there's something to this um, in, in many religions and many religious communities, and that is that, but, but I'll talk about it in, in, in Judaism and my own experience, is that I find that what I've seen happen over the last little while in Judaism, I don't know how long I would say it is, is that as slowly um, um, more and more form, the, the focus has been more and more on the form. And as you look more to the form, you look away from what's behind the form. It's very hard to do the two together. And the way I put it often, I have conversations with people, with, with other rabbis and with other Orthodox Jews about this is I feel that, that we've lost in the Jewish community to a great extent, we've, we've lost God. <laughs> you know, we've, we've, um, we've got a religion, but, but God's not in there anymore. What, what, what role does God play um, in the religion? That we're going through the motions, we're, we're following these laws and these, these traditions that are meant to point you towards God, but we're not getting pointed towards God through them. Because 
if you don't start off, the, the, the rabbis tell us that um, you don't teach Torah, you don't teach Judaism to a student that's not fitting. A person has to have a certain sense of who they are and a certain orientation before, in my mind, before religion, and certainly the way Judaism sees it, before religion will, will help them, before religion will point them in the right direction. And if they don't, if they don't, they're not a decent person or they don't, they're not a spiritual person, they're not a godly person to start with, then you're just putting on clothes, but, but there's, no, there's no real you there. There's no sense of, of, of direction to it. And, and what I find often happens is, is that when you remove God from the story of religion, um, um, one of two things happens. Either people just drop out and aren't interested anymore, or they become more, much more extreme. They become much more extreme in the, because, they, because there's no fulfillment because God's not there because the spiritual isn't there. So they need to look for more and more and more, and, and it just becomes a more extreme form of the, of the, um, of the tradition. Um, that's, that's what I see often happening in Judaism. I, I see it as my, my fundamental goal uh, as, as a rabbi and educator in the Jewish community uh, to bring God back, to bring God back to Judaism, to bring God back to my community. And... I've just seen that I haven't found anything better that, than the three principles to do that. I haven't found the three principles. That there's nothing better than the three principles of pointing people to a spiritual experience, of pointing people to the godliness within themselves, of pointing people to a, a feeling of God. We, Judaism has so much philosophy and so many ideas, and it's all, it's all great ideas, and it's all true ideas uh, uh, in essence. But it's theory, it's, it's concepts. It, it doesn't, it'll only touch somebody who's already touched. It'll only touch somebody, it, it'll only introduce somebody to God who's looking for God, who's looking for something spiritual, who's looking for something deeper. Uh, it, it will enrich somebody who already has a kernel of, of that to start with. And, um, and, I, and I find that, um, and, and I think that's why so many Orthodox Jews, in answer to your kind of uh, puzzlement, uh, Harry, I think the Orthodox <laughs> Jewish community is, is feeling a quite, um, a, a, a many of them are feeling quite disillusioned because they're feeling it's a little bit empty. It's a little bit empty, the, their experience of Judaism. It's, it's, it's form, it's going through the motions. You just need to add one little bit in there and the whole thing comes back to life. You know, it's, it's, it's all there again. It's like one of these um, freeze dried meals, you know, you just add water and, and it was that this little smushed up thing, like all dry and nothing. You add water and now you got steak and chips for dinner. You know, it's like, it's there ready to go. I feel the same thing. I feel Judaism is ready to go. You just got to add God. You just got to add the spiritual. You just got to add the essence of what it's all about. You add that and it, it springs to life again. And I feel that's why, um, that's why Orthodox Jews get so excited about this and get so uh, touched by it and get so involved in it because it's what they're looking for. <laughs> they're looking for something. They don't exactly know what they're looking for. They know they're looking for something. And then this comes along. It's like, oh yeah, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> that's right. Here it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I, now I realize what I was kind of looking for all along, which was that lacking spiritual element, that, that, that being touched on a deeper level, that finding that, that truth within oneself. So, um, that's, uh, that's in my mind why it resonates so much with, with Judaism and uh, with Orthodox Jews. And it's why it resonated so much with me. When I, when I first um, um, learned about the principles, which was, I know how long it was exactly because my daughter was just born, so it was 17 years ago. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, um, I, I just found it that, that it, it, it spoke so much to what I knew already from my Jewish teachings from my Jewish tradition. I, I just found that it, 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 it brought it to life for me. It, 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 made, it made sense of a lot of what I kind of knew was true, but hadn't felt it yet. I hadn't been touched by it. I hadn't experienced it yet. And, and it, it just, it, it unfreeze dried the meal and, and there it was right on a plate ready, ready, to, ready for me to eat. And it's, uh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for to Sid and to all of those I've learned from, because, um, you know, it's so 
added so much to, to my life and to my experience of the world and, and to my experience of my religion. And um, I just feel it's, uh, it's such a, something I was looking for for so long myself and, and, and just so grateful I came across it. To, to add a little uh, to, to your story, Shul, one of the, when, when I introduced Hafiz to Mamun and Omar, because they wanted to talk to the first Muslim who, who was embraced the three principles on Salt Spring. The irony, the irony that I experienced with that introduction was that Hafiz and I were, were both on the island. We were very close friends. We never once talked about our differences, like he was Muslim and I was, uh, I was Jewish. That never even came up. It wasn't because the, 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 con the focus was on the spiritual side of life, because that's what Sid was expressing. And, and that sort of resonates with what you're talking about is when the spiritual side is alive, it's, of course, everybody is alive with God. Everybody is alive with God, but we cover it up with deluded thoughts, you know, blah, 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 blah. And um, so I, I found that ironical when you don't look for differences, there aren't differences. And when you do look for differences, there are differences. And both are needed because because I did notice that Hafiz had a different feeling about the way he was relating to life, like Mamoon and you have a different expression of feeling. But the, the universal feeling was, hey, we're in this spiritual journey. And like you talked about, we don't have a clue where we're going and what it is, but it sure feels good. And that's Salt Spring. Well, I want to say that I just came back to what, what Omar said at the beginning. I love that, what you said, uh, of the, the Dalai Lama says, you know, I really love that, that the, the water, you know, tea is what, 99.99999% uh, water? <laughs> no, that's, and that's the, and that's the, that's what you're having, but, but and that's what matters and that's what nourishes you and that's what, what kind of hydrates you. And it's just flavors. I mean, flavor is so insignificant in a certain way, and yet, yet it matters to us, you know. And it and it should matter to us, and it's good that it matters to us, you know. But but you have to keep your eye on the ball, and and the real ball is the water, and 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 it's just the flavors that 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 uh, separate us, and and it's the water that uh, that sort of uh, you know we have in common, and that's the vast majority of what it's all about. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. And I was just thinking as you were speaking, like if you were to, if you were to take a Muslim and you, and you were to, and they were to ask, all right, give me a surefire way that I'll, you know, do well in this religion, get eternal paradise. You'd probably tell them a few things. And if coming from a Muslim perspective, and if you were to ask a, a, a Jewish person, all right, give me the few things I need to do to get to paradise or, you know, for eternal felicity, for eternal yeah. success, it would be the same few things. <laughs> yeah. Pray, treat your neighbor better than yourself, you know, um, bring as much benefit to people as you can in a short time you've got here, uh, devote yourself wholly and completely to God. It would be the same few things. Um, in the Quran, you know, they're, they're brought up hundreds of, they're, the Quran gives you clues as to what's really important because it's the things that are repeated hundreds of times, right? And it's these things, right? It's these things. Um, every chapter starts with, uh, I, I loved what you were saying about, like, let's <laughs> let's bring God back into the equation here because this religion isn't great without it, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and every, every chapter of the Quran starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the name of Allah, the most loving, the most benevolent. Because nothing else you read is going to make sense without that, <laughs> right? The whole of the rest of the chapter is not going to make sense without without the starting point. Um, yeah, and I love that metaphor too. 
Amar. So thank you for reminding us of it. I've got to ask, Shul, because yeah. your bookshelf is yeah. wetting my appetite. I'm almost salivating looking at that book. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what? That That is every, every Muslim scholar who's worth their salt has a bookshelf like that. Probably different yeah. books. Probably the same big <laughs> ideas. But well, hold on, let's see if we can see. It goes a bit, it goes a bit. I mean, this is a small bookshelf for a rabbi, but um, you see it goes up there and across <laughs> And then, and then it comes around here as well. If you want to see, there's more over here. More over here. Beautiful. <laughs> but that's that's nothing. Yeah. That's how nothing. many? How many of those have you read? <laughs> <laughs> that's the big one. I've actually, they're not like they're not novels, you know. They're not like they're not stories. It's like it's ideas, and they're, they're philosophical. And I wouldn't say you read them. I would say you engage with them. So I've I've sort of engaged with uh, with uh, you know most of the books on these on these shelves <laughs> definitely on some level and in in some way, but I just want to tell you a bit of a funny story because um, the it just remind me of man when we talk about the books um, we um, you know in Judaism we we believe in in um, in oral tradition more so than in written tradition the oral is more important than the written. And, and there's many reasons for that, but one of the reasons is is that something that's written gets stuck in concrete, gets stuck in form. Something that's oral is finds its expression in each individual uh, differently, and, and and so that's the significance and that's the importance of the oral tradition. Um, what happened was two thousand years ago, a particular rabbi came along. And, and decided, and, and I, I believe rightly so at the time, it was a time of the Roman persecution and we Jews were being exiled um, from the land of Israel and, and spread around the world, unfortunately. And, um, and he decided to uh, write it down, write down the tradition because he was worried it was gonna get lost, if not. But he felt that the unbalance, um, it was worse that it would get lost than it would kind of come into form. So he decided to write it down, but but it's considered to be a um, sort of not a good thing that's written down, you know, not not a. It's a shame that it needed to be written down. So I once went to a particular rabbi's house, and he wanted to show me his library. Now, now, if you think this is a big library, he his library was I would say twenty times the size of this. I would guess twenty times the size of this. It was it was floor to ceiling. Uh, uh, all around massive room a library so he was very excited and i couldn't help myself i i i regret that i said this but it just kind of came out he said um well what do you think of my library isn't it amazing and isn't it and i said to him uh, in hebrew it's uh, i don't know how you translate his name it's like a um a, a shame and an embarrassment <laughs> he said what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> he said, I said, it's a shame and embarrassment that, that this, that all of this needs to be on books and isn't within ourselves. <laughs> you know? That we shame that we need books. We, that those ideas, we should embody those ideas. Those ideas should be within us. We should be knowing and living and understanding those ideas, not, not, not have them on books in a library. What do you want them on books in a library for? So um, it didn't go down well <laughs> when I said he, he didn't he didn't appreciate it. But, and, and like I said, in retrospect, I wouldn't have said it, but it was just like a bit of a knee jerk reaction to uh, to seeing this big library. So. So, yeah. That's that's funny. Do have, that reminds me. Do we have anyone who wants to ask a question or get in the discussion of this? How about you, Mark? Oh, Joe, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, something came to me. Hmm. Is that God really is the feeling, and the feeling comes from silence, and that the feeling transcends all language, uh, description, and concepts, and that the great thing is we don't have to understand God, we have to feel God, and that the word of God is the silence and the feeling, and then when everybody has that feeling in them, we know that we're all the same, and we can all connect with each other.
I have a story about this rabbi who uh, travels to um, Washington State to visit the psychologist. And um, it, this is a story about Shawl, of course. <laughs> and uh, he visits, um, this is the way that I heard the story. And I've repeat. so if I tell the story and it's wrong, then uh, because I repeat the story, you can correct me and then I'll be telling it. Give opportunity. <laughs> I want to get that story right. But I've always liked this story, you know. So the way it, the, the way it works is Shawl and his partner travel to the psychologist, uh, George Pransky, and uh, his wife and a few other people, Dick and Bettinger, in the state of Washington. And they spent a lot of money to go there. And they've got some big issue to... Uh, work out and having a lot of trouble working out this issue something to do with the business relationship between them or something like that so far so good pardon me so am, I, so am I okay good. so far yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh so uh shawl goes there and the therapy for the first three or four days is to not talk about the problem they just uh, you know you know what dick and bettinger is like or the people who know him He's just this lovely guy, very one of the greatest teachers in the 3P movement. Very lovely guy, very, very positive. And I, I would say he teaches love more than anything. Anyways, and after about three or four days, what I understand the story goes is this rabbi named Shaul Rosenblatt. He uh, and his partner are not too happy with the very, very, very expensive therapy they're getting from Dick and Bettinger and the Pranskys. And it's a lot of money to travel back and forth and the payment of them. And this is not a dime or a dollar, you know. So, uh, and they just keep talking about the weather and how great the Pacific Northwest is, other issues, but not about this big problem. So uh, the way the story goes is uh, 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 the rabbi's not too happy and goes back to his room and all of a sudden something happens and what happens is that, that this is the way i understand the story shawl is yeah. that that you let go of the problem completely mm -hmm. and um and or the little mind you might call it and you describe it as and this is why i tell the story is that you experience completely god in motion and yeah, then yeah. what? So far, so good. <laughs> it, it, have I got this right? Got it right. You got it right. Yeah, okay. okay. So God <laughs> motion and like as soon as I heard that, I like oh yeah, that is it. And then you, you send a message or something to um, to your partner that don't worry about anything. Everything's fine. Like the, the it, it's going into the depth of of the um, uh, into the formlessness that really just solved the issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you you did self-therapy and, and, and someone trying to help you, they helped you in the best way by creating a complete environment of positivity. Yeah, that's pretty much it, you know? I mean- Is I that the just, story? But if, yeah, if you just want me to correct a few details, you know, um, um, but you got it right, uh, you know? You got the water, you just didn't get the flavors of the tea, you know, so <laughs> I would, uh, I would correct that um, it was, uh, it was Aaron Turner and Keith Blevins, not Dickin and George. Oh, yeah. It wasn't Pransky and Associates though, so it was, you know, you got the right, uh, the right place. And, um, and what I discovered was, I went back, you're right, I went back to my hotel room and I would say, I just got touched by God. I just, I just felt God. In, in an unbelievably deep way for the first time in my life. Yeah. And, and when you shone God, so to speak, on the problem, uh, it didn't just look very small. It, it looked like it wasn't there even, you know, well, what's the problem? When, when you put it in the, you sort of, through the lens of, of the greatness of this universe, um, this is so insignificant that why am I having a fight with this guy again? I can't remember. You know, seems seems so relevant what we were fighting about in the given the awe that I felt about God and the greatness of, of, of life.
that's that's kind of what happened. And but I would say more than that, what happened was when I started going back because I was going back for another session, and I started thinking about my partner. This was a guy who I came on the verge of hating. I would say I would say I felt so much animosity towards him when we arrived there. The only thing I could feel for him was love. All that had been replaced with love. Because that's that's it, you know. God is love, and love is God, and uh, it's all the same story. And and when you live in a feeling of godliness, when you live in a feeling of, of spiritual reality and spiritual truth, and you get touched by that, you only feel love. It, 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 it oh. wipes everything clean. It, it's like it's love is like it's like a a um what is it? It's like it's like a soap, you know, and it just it just washes everything out. And spreads. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what happened in your story is you went back with this unbelievable fresh eyes and fresh insight. And you started to share from the new mm -hmm. Rabbi show level of consciousness. And, and as near as I heard the story, then you went to a class and, and, and then your top student heard something and before you knew it, it was just spreading like crazy. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad I got the story right. Yeah, well done, Martin. It's, it's a good it. story. Uh, and, uh, I, 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 you know, you can see why. Marty, 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 it's enough. Okay. I want to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so we, uh, I want to read this quote uh, to you, Mamoon, uh, regarding uh, Kath, we had Kath, uh, Catherine Jones on our show um, uh, uh, from Australia, a, a student of yours. And uh, I want, uh, she said, to, she, this is what she said. Uh, uh, in the connection of the, of the Muslim faith and three principles, the connection of those two, two things. Uh, uh, I, she says, I see the Quran as the word of Allah and the three principles as the scientific truth of our human experience. Is that sort of how you see that? Yes, and very succinct. And you know when the student kind of takes over the teacher? <laughs> <laughs> That's the vibe I'm getting right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah she, she's she's deep. She's oh, I'm very oh. very impressed with with her understanding. And Rabbi Shaw, the interesting part of her, she was not born a Muslim, and became a Muslim, and she got exposed to the inside out tr teachings of Mamun, and then mm. she took it and has created this very impressive um, school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But of course, what impresses me was her way of expressing her love of, of her religion and her love of the three principles and how she has found a new path, like you found a path, a new path of sharing God in a way that, that resonated deep within her. And without getting wordy about it, very impressive, very impressive. Yeah. See, if I, if I just just kind of coming up coming off that, I would say, and I think it's I think you know you can say the same thing in so many different ways. I would put it that um, the three principles point to God, and Judaism points to God, and they're both pointing in the same direction. And they're both pointing to the same thing, and and so you know there's, there's, there is. There's some richness in what the three principles have to give me in terms of my understanding. And then there's a different richness that my Judaism gives me in terms of understanding. But, but the, the goal, the destination is the same for both. Well, but, but isn't one, one is dealing with, like, it's always nice to talk to people who, as you mentioned, who have a feeling of God. And then they're usually a little weaker in the psychological aspect of life. And then it's always interesting to talk to people with psychological, but they don't soar very high. You know, they just yeah. can't, they can't get out of their, 
beyond just solving their problems type of thing. Is it, it, it to, like for me, Shul, it was very difficult to bring those two worlds together. Mm-hmm. I always saw spiritual, the good stuff, and yes. psychological, the boring stuff. And, uh, and, and then one day those two worlds became one. And then I saw, oh, it doesn't matter what I'm talking about because it's all the same thing. You see, I see it that the, I don't know if I can articulate this well, but I'll, I'll try it. The, the spiritual sits on top of the psychological and it kind of trumps the psychological and it, it supersedes the psychological almost. And, and you, can, you can understand the psychological through the lens of the spiritual, which kind of helps you sort of deal with the nitty gritty and the day to day of the world. But I still think what you're looking towards is to transcend the psychological and uh, push yourself into the spiritual. That, that's kind of how I would see it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's that, that's what I'm looking to do. That makes sense to me. The, the psychological is a limitation. The spiritual is is infinite. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The um, the spiritual you're talking about. That's I think that's why so many of uh, like so many of us of different religions and in in my experience in the work that I do, I've seen so many Muslims get so on board and be so tr- deeply transformed because the psychological kind of points you towards where the door is, but on the other side of the door is where all of the spiritual um, connection and transcendence and all of the things that Muslims their whole lives have been wanting, right? We've been reading the Quran and being like, oh, it would be great to be more resilient. Oh, I'd love to have more rahma more like love and kindness and more forgiveness and all of these things but uh yeah but 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 it wasn't in, for many for myself at least it wasn't until i saw this little distinction about where experience comes from that i was like oh oh that's where experience comes from oh that's interesting and before i knew it i was swept off my feet because then i'd read the quran again and be like no way. <laughs> look at what it's saying how did I not read this before? Even the first page of the Quran, which summarizes the message of the whole Quran, I would have in which every Muslim learns when they're a, when they're a child, and you recite it several times in every prayer every day for your whole life. And suddenly, that chapter started to open. Like it, I started to have insight into it that <laughs> that I never got from a madrasa because I, I didn't see where experience was coming from literally right um i have a couple of quick uh things on on the stuff that rabbi well the stuff that everybody's been sharing but one is i i love that judaism is primarily an oral tradition because islam is as well and um and this there's this great story of imam al-ghazali who lived like a, a thousand years ago and he was uh, traveling from one city to another in, in search of knowledge and sort of in search of great scholars and scholarship. And he was traveling with his library. So he had like a caravan and it contained all of his books. And as he was traveling, um, some bandits came along and stuck him up. And he was like, they, they took his caravan and he was like, no, 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 please don't take all of my books. <laughs> that's like all of my knowledge is in that caravan it will it'll, it probably it might not even be meaningful to you but to me it's everything please don't take my knowledge that's in that caravan and the bandit said what kind of knowledge is in books that can just be taken away from you and later imam al-ghazali reflected and and he said maybe it wasn't even a bandit maybe it was an angel who came to teach me the most important lesson. And uh, that always really struck me. It, it said that from then on, he just, he just memorized everything. <laughs> he, was, he was one of those masters of the tradition, right? And uh, he has this uh, incredible work. It's, it's, very, it's now being translated into English, but it's a 40 volume work 
Uh, it's called Ihya Ulum al-Din, the revival of the religious sciences. And he was wrestling with a problem that, that we've been wrestling with and that you, that you described earlier. It's like, well, hang on a second. If God's been taken out, the, the rest of the religion isn't that great without it, right? Um, and, and he wrote this 40 volume work. It's very logically sequenced. It's, it's actually very beautiful. Um, and the first book of the 40, the first book is the book of knowledge and the last book is the book of death. And the idea is, you know, knowledge is from cradle to the grave, right? And he starts the book of knowledge by saying, there are two kinds of knowledge. There is a kind that can be studied and talked and, and taught and implemented and acted on. And in Arabic, it's called mu'amala, knowledge of action. And there's a kind that's real knowledge, which is knowledge for its own sake. It can't really be taught. It can't really be studied. It can't even be written about. So what you'll get in the next 40 volumes <laughs> is knowledge of the mu'amala, because the idea is that by following some of these things, maybe you'll be pointed towards a reflective enough space where the other knowledge, the, the other knowledge is called mokashafa, which means unveiling. And it's what we might think of as insightful knowledge, as knowledge that comes directly from inside of you, from your own soul. It's given to you by God. It's, it's wisdom, right? And it was really funny because my whole life I'd heard of this book and it, it and it seemed as though like the first half of the book dealt with the outward stuff, like worship and how to treat people. And the second half seemed to deal with inward stuff, like the uh, diseases of the heart, you know, like anger and hatred and jealousy and the praiseworthy traits like love and all, you know, kindness and all that. But as I read it, after coming across the principles, I was like, oh, wait a second. No, he said he had this little disclaimer on the very first page in the introduction to the introduction where he said this whole thing is actually about the outward. And the inward you'll only get when it comes, right? And you can follow the outward and it will, it, it's designed to point you towards the inward, but I can't even teach you the inward. And I, I, that really struck me because yeah, there was a while after I came across the, the principles when I didn't get what preachers were saying anymore. I was like, what do you, I, it just seemed like, it seemed on such a more superficial level and it was a little bit later when I came across the work of a spiritual master, a very well-respected scholar and spiritual master in the tradition. And I read that and I was like, oh, he must have, how did he study the principles? He lived a few hundred years before Sidney Banks. But then I, I realized it's all, it's all there and it's always been there. It's just so easy to overlook because it's like that old Sufi story where uh, there's, there's a man looking for his diamond ring and, uh, police officer comes and says, what, what are you looking for? He says, a diamond ring. And he says, oh, okay, let me help you find it. And they're both on their knees, crawling around, looking for the diamond ring. And the police officer says, well, well, well where did you lose it? And he goes, oh, I, I lost it over there on the street. He goes, I, I lost it over there in the bushes, sorry. And the police officer says, well, if you lost it over there in the bushes, why are we looking here underneath the street lamp? And the man, the man says, oh, well, the light's better here, you know? The light's better here. It's so much easier to talk about the outward and the form because everybody can see it. It's, it's form. You can touch it. You know, you, you can describe the prayers. You can tell people where the mosque is. But the inward is where it's at. And it's not as... Uh... <laughs> the light's not shining on it in most of the world and in most preachers and in most lectures. It's there. It's underneath. You know? Anyway, um. I just wanted to share that. You really reminded me of that when you told the story of the, uh, yeah, it's a shame if the knowledge is just in books. Yeah. yeah. The, the rabbis say very succinctly in the, in the Talmud that, um, that a, uh, a wise man, so to speak, they wouldn't call him a wise man, uh, could be like a donkey carrying books. I think it's a great metaphor, you know? You've got this donkey <laughs> and it's got all these books on it, you know? It's like laden with books. You've got all this wisdom. <laughs> but it's still a donkey it's like and you unfortunately you find people like that you know they've learned they've learned they've learned they know all the information they can spout it all out like a, a computer disk but uh, you know still a donkey it's uh it's only when you get touched by it it's only when you you see it for yourself when you feel the truth of it that you you become at one with it 
mm. uh, as opposed to it sitting superficially on you, which uh, is exactly what you're talking about there, Moen. Beautiful. Yeah, we have the same analogy, and it is a donkey as well. It's not like a camel. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it, I mentioned it in my book, so I know I got it from somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> that same metaphor. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Well, our traditions are very linked, you know. I mean, they, they you know, there is uh, a Christianity as well. You know, there is a uh, there's a strong sort of uh, connection between, uh, you know, they come from the same part of the world, and you know, they 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 were related to each other, and there was conversations and sort of uh, discussions between the different uh, religions as they develop. So, um, you know, Absolutely. it makes sense that there would be a lot of uh, common yeah. form, not just common formless, which obviously is there, but common form as well. So well, aren't we brothers? Yeah. Aren't we like, isn't the Jewish and the Muslim brothers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we... Yeah, well, I mean, we come from, yeah, we, I mean, we both agree, funnily enough, you know, both our traditions agree that we come from common ancestry, which is yeah. a funny thing when you think about it. The, and maybe they say there's no fight like a family fight, you know, there's truth to that, but it's, uh, <laughs> that, that's probably what's going on there. <laughs> but when you see the, the animosity, unfortunately, that there has been throughout the generations, um, um, it's it's a shame, you know. It's a real shame. We're actually we're actually family, ultimately. Yeah, the Quran talks more of Moses, peace and blessings upon him, than hello. It, the name the name well, of Moses I, 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 is mentioned uh, more in the Quran than the name yeah. of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings really? upon him. Wow. Yeah, there was lots of stories about him. Every Friday we were meant to read the uh, Surah Kahf which has a beautiful story about Moses in there, uh, which I won't bore everyone with now, but it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, and there's so many, so many gems because really the Quran uses stories of prophets and, and if, I know most people here probably, probably know this, but Muslims believe in all of the prophets of Judaism uh, and all of the prophets of Christianity and uh, peace and blessings <laughs> upon them all. And uh, yeah, we're following the same teachers, how we're, how we're misunderstanding their message, right? Yeah. Where we're fighting each other is, is crazy, but incredible, isn't it? Yeah, really and that's why. Uh, I, I think uh, Moses is mentioned more than any other uh, prophet in the Quran. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, and, and so I'm, sure you know this as well. I'm sure you know this as well. But obviously, in Judaism, he is considered the um, the father of all prophets, Moses. You know, there is there is no one that that comes up to his uh, ankles in prophets in in Judaism either. You know, he is the greatest of them all. So, again, that's a shared uh, shared understanding. Beautiful, yeah. In in Islam, Abraham, Moses, Noah, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace and blessings upon them all. Um, they're the the all time top five human beings. <laughs> so. Uh, I always like that, that there's, there's this kind of spiritual, uh, well, well, this re let's say religious hierarchy. And, uh, and yeah, it's so funny that at least three of them cross over with Judaism. One of them crosses over with Christianity. Um, it's just, uh, we pray for Abraham and his followers, which is all Jewish people, in every prayer, five times a day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's uh, so if... if <laughs> When God is back in the equation and we actually pay attention to what we're saying, it's it's like, how could there be anything but love? Yeah, exactly. And and unfortunately, you know, the the teaching that the teachings that I sometimes hear, um, and the attitudes that I sometimes hear in the in the Jewish community, the Orthodox community, when you kind of take the feeling out of it, when you take the feeling out of the religion, um, are so disappointing and so, um, you know, uh, prejudiced and, and so um, arrogant, you know, I, I'm not saying everybody in every circumstance, but, but uh, because if you take the feeling away, you've taken what it's all about away, you know, you've taken the essence away, if you take the essence away, you, you're left with just a shell and, and, and the shell doesn't offer you much. Exactly. It, one, one of the, to... oh sorry 
go ahead, go ahead. Well, just, I just want just because I was I was going to say this a while ago, I never got a chance to say it. It was, it was in response to something that Mahmoud had said. I don't I don't remember what it was. So I apologize, but just a um, I want to give you a quote that um, I'm I'm writing. Um, I'm in the process of publishing a book on prayer, um, on, on sort of how to um, find meaning in prayer and how to find connection um, in prayer. Uh, and and I, this is this is the first thing in my introduction. I say I quote from a rabbi from 500 years ago, and he says there are those who genu genuinely proclaim God's oneness in the Shema. The Shema is a prayer talking about God's oneness. And um, pray they pray to Him in Shemona Esrei. The Shemona Esrei is the essence of the Jewish prayer service, and they bless His name in blessings. He says, and then there are those who recite the Shema. But do not proclaim his oneness. They say the Shemona essay, but they're not praying. They say a blessing, but they do not bless God. And um, and I think that really and, and he says even then, you know, I thought this was a modern phenomenon, but he says even 500 years ago, he said I looked around and I saw that um, the the first group, the, the, sorry, the second group, of very 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 many people. Who kind of go through the motions but don't really feel it, and um, the the first group are very few in number, and um, and and so I feel it's not what our challenges of today. Are, I don't think are modern challenges. I think they're they're something that we human beings have always faced. Um, this challenge of, of really it comes back to what my mum was saying about looking under the um, looking under the light. You know, we we we're, we're we're attracted to form. We human beings like a like like a moth to the fire. You know, we just it's just more appealing. It's just and 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 so the form of the religion is what is what sucks people in because you can touch it and you can feel it and you it, it's 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 not it's not tangible. Um, and those that look beyond that are, are fewer in number, unfortunately, because it's just harder. It's just harder to look in that direction. And I think as, as religious teachers, and I think uh, sounds to me, you know, I don't want to speak for my moment, but very much sounds to me like we're on the same page over here. In my mind, it's, it's almost a battle to point people towards the formless. And, and I wouldn't say away from the form, but to see the form, but see through the form to the formless, to see beyond it to the formless is hard work. <laughs> it's really it's hard going in in a, in a religious community to do that. But, um, but you know, I think we need people who are dedicated to doing so, otherwise the religion just doesn't offer people what it has to offer. Yeah. And thank God we have teachers like Rabbi Scholl, you know, because everything you're saying, I literally, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not only like listening to an Imam, it's, uh, in our tradition, like the scholars are the scholars, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, and, and to hear a scholar speak, uh, who obviously has the external knowledge and the books to prove it, uh, <laughs> but also has, but also has the internal knowledge and the depth to prove it as well. It's, uh, it's, it's really touching and it's humbling. And thank you so much for, um, for doing what you do and for just really forging the path. There are so many parallels between our communities. And I think if our community could uh, uh, emulate and take the excellent example given by yourself and your community and the work that you've been doing, uh, we, we would, it would be great. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, vice versa, Mamun, I, I feel, I don't just say it because, you know, <laughs> it's the politically correct thing to say. I genuinely feel I, I, I've really, enjoyed listening to you and, and, and feel that there's not a single thing you said that doesn't resonate entirely with me. Me too. That's the, yeah. In the Koran, Rabbi Shul, they, they, they have a teaching that Kathleen mentioned in our last show that the purpose, the reason God broke us up into different tribes was so that we would learn to understand different points of view towards the same towards the same thing and that to me really resonates with with my experience with this with this uh, uh, room was 
was I knew absolutely zero about the Muslim religion or the Mus or the or and not uh, a ton, although more than most exposure to to people from the Muslim faith and so on. And and what I what I found was that the conversations were more interesting than among my own people. They were different. They had different viewpoints. And they started to teach me about detachment. It's a very big concept in terms of leaving the form behind. And I learned just tons and tons about detachment from listening to Omar and our sharings in the room. I was expanding my consciousness into another into another dimension. And then Omar started bringing in the wisdom of Rumi and these different, like not cool, not amazing, beyond comparison of amazing. And it touched everyone. So all of a sudden people in the 3P community, I know tons of people reading Rumi now because, because, of, because of what Omar brought, brought in and introduced. And, and they're just as enamored with the wisdom of Moses as they are with the wisdom of Rumi. And uh, it's just, it's, I am not, Sid teaches, I am not a drop in the ocean. And Rumi says, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are an ocean in a drop. And I go, what the heck does that mean? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and it, I, it, it's taken me months to absorb the, the teachings of, of that. And, and I just wanted to tell this one story since, since I've got the wavelength for a second. I brought, my father was the least prejudiced person in the universe. He just didn't have any, any, anything for that. And he was a furrier. So I, brought, I was in, in a different city and I brought, he traveled to the city and he wanted, of course, being Jewish, Rabbi Scholl, he wanted to get talk business to someone so he could write it off as a business expense. That's Jewish <laughs> uh, tradition and uh, uh, tradition. And, uh, and so I says, yeah, I, I'll introduce you to this very classy Muslim uh, furrier from uh, e Egypt. And the two got together and just had the best of time. And I was so curious what my dad thought about this, this experience. I said, so dad, what did you think of, of, of uh, uh, this man? And he says, same as the Jews. And that's the truth. Same as the Jews. He said, couldn't see any difference. Mm -hmm. And did they have a good time? Oh yeah. And did he get it right at office of business expense? Yeah. <laughs> very good yeah. I'm, I'm conscious that Mamoun I know is uh, is on a bit of a tight schedule here uh, I don't know Mamoun you know and yeah. you've got kids to put to bed and things <laughs> do we have before uh, we yeah look, we, we're ready to close the show but does anyone have a final uh, anything or other that they would like to suggest or anything before we we wrap it up of this rather interesting topic. Can I finish with a joke, Harry? Yes, of course. After all, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a, 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 go ahead. You reminded me of it and, and I only heard it yesterday. So it's fresh, a fresh joke. A fresh joke, that is unusual, okay. And it's a, it's a in my mind, it's a little bit anti-Semitic, but I think I'm Jewish so I can get away with it. <laughs> so. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll it's, make sure I don't laugh. I'll do my yeah, laugh. Exactly. Yeah. No one who, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. <laughs> no one who isn't Jewish here is allowed to laugh. So I'm going to watch you all. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, there's a little boy, a little Jewish boy, who's going to a Catholic school, and the teacher says to uh, teach to the class, um, um, who was uh, who? I'm going to give uh, ten dollars. Uh, some American person telling it. So it's in dollars. Ten dollars. To anybody who can tell me who is the greatest human being in history. So one boy puts his hand up and he says, uh, Martin Luther King. And he's, the teacher says, no, sorry, that is a great man, but, but not the one. So um, another boy puts his hand up and he says, uh, Mother Teresa. And he says, no, great woman, but I'm sorry, 
not the greatest human in history. So there's a little Jewish boy in the back and he puts his hand up and he says, I, sir, I think it was Jesus. And he says, yeah, you got it. Absolutely. He says, but let me ask you a question, you know. He says, surely you're, you're Jewish, you know. Is that, is that really what you believe, <laughs> that Jesus is the greatest person in history? And he says, well, no, actually, if you ask me what I really believe, I think it was Moses. But, uh, but you know, there's $10 involved and business is business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is a Jewish joke. That is a good Jewish joke, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. You know, what's so what's what's just I'll let me just once in a in a in indigenous in a sweat lodge, I I the the indigenous people love laughing about the Jewish people. Uh but they have tremendous respect for them because they're rich and uh or theoretically rich. And, <laughs> and so I said, Oh, there's one thing that Jewish people like more than money. And I said, it's food. And everyone goes, sure, sure, sure. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. No, that's true. You're right, Harry. You're definitely <laughs> right about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we've approached the end of this amazing uh, conversation. I really uh, feel much lighter uh, than I did uh, when I introduced the show. So thank you, uh, Rabbi Shaw, for accepting our invite and, and coming here. And thank you, Mamoun, for coming as well and having this uh, amazing conversation. And thank you, Harry, as well, for your sharings. And uh, I just want to share one last quote that I've read in a friend of mine. Uh, uh, I think he shared it on Facebook. I can't remember who said this, but it's quite what we were discussing, actually. <clears throat> And it says that the universes weren't created to see them, but to see uh, uh, the, their, created, their creator in them. Mm -hmm. So I love that. we get stuck in the form and uh, we could you know, agree and disagree in the form, but beyond that, uh, there is a space where we all connect and uh, it's, it's all spiritual in there. And, and, and this is where Actually, we, we all meet. And if only we could, you know, take the ego off the, the equation, we will have a better world, you know, Muslim or Jewish or Christian or any other religion. Um, we will just meet in that space uh, that Rumi describes, like uh, beyond right doing and wrong doing, there is a space, I'll meet you there. Between wrong doing and right doing, there is a space, I'll meet you there, the neutral space. So yeah, thanks for uh, our participants and uh, see you in two weeks for another show. Thank you, everyone. And, and Mamoun, we should talk about what we could do together, you know? I think uh, yes. there's a lot of commonality here. Let's let's have a chat. Definitely. That's beautiful idea, Definitely. Rabbi Sho. Honestly, Definitely. fantastic. It warms my heart to hear you say that. Yeah, absolutely, great. Thank